This slideshow is directed to everyone who watched my Jungle Bubble video linked in the description. In particular, I'd like to thank those of you who shared your feedback and questions, and indeed your inspiration. I read every single comment prior to posting this. All I ask is that before you comment below, please watch both videos from start to finish. So first of all, what you're looking at is my first attempt at what I call an eco-aquarium. Eco-aquarium is simply the name I've given to the hybrid design philosophy incorporating some of your criticisms with the original jungle bubble concept. I've provided a link to a video about eco-aquariums in the description as well. So in the five years since the video was released, I've worked to develop an insulated ecosystem with more humane regard for the fish, more stable ecology, and lower cost per gallon. I never expected it to take so long, but until recently my living situation simply did not support the required experimentation. But at the same time, I didn't wish to just pontificate in the comments without providing a living, breathing proof of concept. But back to basics. I think it would be constructive to look at one of the early progenitors of Jungle Bubble in order to illuminate some of my mistakes along the way to developing the eco-aquarium. And by the way, I don't consider the eco-aquarium to be the pinnacle of sustainable aquatic design. It's simply my next step on the road to some theoretically self-sufficient insulated ecosystem. So here we have a three gallon bowl back in June of 2009, about a year before Jungle Bubble. As you can see, the bio load is entirely too high under the best of circumstances, involving about 15 guppies in an environment that probably should not have more than four. But there's another problem. Notice that the gravel is pristine. There's nothing for the plants to eat. The idea, of course, was that the fish waste would fertilize them, and indeed it would have. Unfortunately, the plants were not yet rooted and, in any event, lacked sufficient space to propagate to an extent which would have enabled full waste recycling. The outcome was unfortunately predictable. I lost fish because the ammonia rapidly accumulated before the plants could sufficiently neutralize it. So, in hindsight, I should have waited a month or two for the plants to grow before adding the fish. Fertilizing their roots with root tabs, vitamin pill fragments, or simply potting soil would have worked well. Having said that, I don't believe in creating entire layers of potting soil beneath the gravel as espoused by the Wallstead method that some of you have generously pointed out. I think it risks too much nutrient release in the event that the soil were to intersect with the water column. So when it comes to nutrient delivery, I would say that surgical precision is preferable. The plant species are also immensely important. As you can see, I made the mistake of covering a large portion of the gravel with java fern, which grows too slowly to act as a useful filter. And by the way, aeration and circulation would have helped a lot as well, as many of you have pointed out about jungle bubble, although it would not have solved the ammonia problem in this case. The only good thing I can say about this bowl is that it had a relatively high surface area to volume ratio, which under circumstances of many more plants and many fewer fish would have helped sustain the ecosystem. So after a few more unsuccessful attempts, the result was jungle bubble, pictured here about five months before the video was shot. As you can see, I was careful this time to keep the bio load to a minimum while allowing the plants to settle in. So only a few small tetras were present. And as you can see, the green and red cryptocorny leaves have a waxy luster, which is indicative of plants which have been grown semi-aquatically. They need about a month to morph into their true aquatic form, allowing them to grow and propagate underwater. By the way, that grassy looking stuff in the foreground, which many of you have asked about, is Echinodorus tenellus, otherwise known as pygmy chainsword. It seldom grows above 15 centimeters in height, so it's an excellent carpeting plant to use for filtration and decoration while not obscuring the view. I should also point out the rock. rock rocks make great landscaping, but can occasionally alter your water chemistry. In particular, avoid rocks which have a rough surface that might easily dissolve. Now, some of you have criticized me for keeping a ram cichlid in such a small bowl. It was an eight gallon bowl, but in hindsight, I agree. This sort of environment is best suited to tiny fish and invertebrates. It has also been pointed out that I failed to heat the bowl. This is true, but at the time I was living in the tropics, so I had no such need. But if you live in a cooler climate, then this is definitely an issue for you. Unfortunately, spherical bowls do not lend themselves well to the use of aquarium heaters, so some creativity is necessary. For instance, you might do better to mount the heater permanently under the gravel. However, the simplest solution might be to choose a cylinder instead of a bowl. I'll discuss cylinders later in the video. As you can see, the planting is fairly dense, but not yet what I would call lush. So as soon as I realized this, 
I realized that the single 4 watt LED was insufficient. I needed to add several watts of fluorescent light in order to accelerate the growth, leading to what you see in the video. These days, of course, one would simply add more LED bulbs. Equally important at this point was the addition of liquid fertilizer. Let me just say that, while useful during the initial growth phase, some of these solutions are toxic, and many of them fertilize algae as well as plants. My current approach involves saturation planting, which is discussed in detail in the Eco Aquarium video. I no longer use artificial fertilizers of any kind, save for a vitamin pill fragment here and there. So what happened to Jungle Bubble? Well, despite prognostications to the contrary, it worked just fine. The biggest problem I encountered, apart from the frequent need to trim back the plants, was the need to scrape green spot algae from the glass. But this would need to occur in almost any aquarium because very few species actually consume this hard form of algae. So after scraping the glass, the water would of course turn a little bit green. But that was fine because I also needed to siphon the detritus off the gravel. I had to clean like this every several days, but that's the price of having a little bubble of paradise on one's desk. Now a few times the CO2 pressure got out of hand because I had what was, in hindsight, a very low quality regulator on my CO2 tank. And contrary to what was said in the comments, I did have a bubble counter, and although my CO2 was stored at 70 pounds per square inch, it was coming out at a much lower and safer pressure. However, I no longer use any CO2 at all. Instead, I rely on a sufficient but not excessive bioload to nourish the plants. I might add that it seems to be more effective to have many small gills producing CO2 than a few large ones. So for healthy plants, think in terms of large schools of small fish to the extent that the size of the tank can safely accommodate them. Now, when I moved away, I donated Jungle Bubble to a friend who, despite the best of intentions, was apparently never destined to become an aquarist. All I know is that, a few months later, it became an eight-gallon goldfish bowl. Needless to say, while I can only blame myself for this error of judgment, I could not be more thrilled, frankly, with the productive discussion and analysis which the original video generated. Personally, it caused a shift in my thinking towards cylinders and away from spherical bowls. Cylinders are simply more accommodating with regard to powerheads, filters, heaters, and so forth. More importantly, the shorter, wider ones offer a much greater surface area to volume ratio. Here, for example, is a new project that I've been working on. It features a power head for circulation, but on account of the 40 centimeter wide surface atop only 30 centimeters of water depth, I don't currently need any supplemental aeration. Once I add more fish, I might need it, but even then I wouldn't want excessive bubbles because they could evict CO2 from the water, which would be bad for the plants. It's all a question of balance as usual. So for now, I have only a few tiny pygmy sunfish, which is sufficient to allow the plants to take root and grow. And the growth has been spectacular. I actually trimmed about half the plants before taking this photo. So I've yet to decide on which fish species to add, and I hope to make a video of the completed setup in the future. Now, I know that many of you have asked me where to get huge bowls of the jungle bubble variety. And most likely, some of you will want to know where to get a cylinder like this one. Suffice to say that I'll provide links in the description. But this particular cylinder is no longer made. It was very fortunate for me that I picked it up for $40 on Craigslist, thereby saving money, minimizing my environmental footprint, and making a great friend in the process. So, in closing, there is tremendous value in domesticating a volume of wilderness, if only a few gallons worth, and if only in the corner of one's room because doing so reinforces the bond between humanity and nature, which would otherwise atrophy with the technological ascendancy of civilization, ultimately to the point at which the great wild itself would be confined to museums or history books. If instead we gaze for a few minutes every day upon the tiny miracles that are otherwise so easily ignored, we might immunize ourselves against the shifting baseline of an ever-declining environment to which we erroneously recalibrate our definition of wildness generation after generation. And that bull right there can remind us that it was not always like this, for there was a time when everything was strictly organic.